Hi everyone, I'm Kim Baylor, the owner of Youthful Fiber Farm and Mill, and I have fiber in my mouth. Oh my gosh. Okay, welcome everyone. I am the owner of Youthful Fiber Farm and Mill. We'll start again. And I'm sitting here in the mill in Halsey, Oregon, getting ready to talk about wool. So if you are new, I'm gonna talk a lot about wool. I've got some great processing wool videos from inside the mill. And if you are returning, Welcome, you'll get to see all that same stuff. And we have to do a follow-up on talking about storage bobbins and supported spindle talk. So I think what I'm gonna do is start with all the processing videos, mix it up a little bit, and then we'll um, do some follow-up from last episode because you all had such wonderful comments and it's, I just love this community and it's why I love doing all the Zooms and everything because it's just so fun. I get to hear what everybody else's take on it is and what they've done and the options. So thank you everybody. Okay, this month for Fiber Club was Rommeldale CVM. And I, am, I have videos talk, walking you through washing, picking, carding. You all, I am so excited that the picking worked with my machine and I didn't have to hand pick at all. That was like the biggest hurrah hurrah for me on this fiber. Now this is one of my absolute favorite fine wools. I consider it a fine wool. Uh, the microns tend to be in the low 20s. So that's fine. That's a fine wool in my world. Uh, and it's just absolutely stunning. I prefer it over merino, partially because uh, it's, it's not, what should I say? I'm not going to say it's not merino. I love merino too, but it's not as standard of a wool. I think it's often overlooked and it just has a very different feel to it when it's finished yarn than merino for being such a nice wool that sits next to your skin. I should be wearing my faucet top, I realized, but I forgot. So I'm gonna put a picture of it here because this sweater is all hand spun, Rommeldale, natural colored, and next to skin, it's beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. So if you have not spun Rommeldale, give it a shot. But let's talk about it for a minute because I have a couple samples to show you. So this is before I show you the processing, I just want to show you, this is some of the wool from the fleeces that made up this batch. So this is actually from the same fleece. This was a nice large fleece. Their fleeces are pretty sizable. I'm going to say the fleeces uh, post skirting were somewhere in the six to seven pounds each. Now you're going to lose a fair amount to lanolin because these are running on the finer wool end, but you can see this was a variegated gray and kind of browns and I'm hoping you can see I have different um, samples I can show you but you can see the tiny little crimp in there that we all love so much in our fine wools. Here is a white um, that is going to show the crimp beautifully. You can see that tiny tiny tiny. So this is a different fleece and you can see how they have it has a very kind of um, flattened top which is what we expect from most fine wools and um yeah from most fine wools merino is the same they have more of that flat top versus more of a pointed and here is one that's a little bit different but not so different uh so this is rommeldale still but it was crossed with rambouillet and you can see it has a little bit of a bigger crimp but still absolutely stunning now here's the fun so it, i wasn't too bothered by it, throwing this fleece in because Rommeldale is, came about from crossing Romney sheep and Rambouillet. So you take the beauty of the Romney and a little bit of, guess what you get with that, a little luster, and then you cross it with the fineness of the Rambouillet and you basically get perfection in a wool. Uh, that's how I feel about Rommeldale. So those are some of the fleeces that came together. There were four fleeces that came together to make the roving that you'll see in the upcoming videos. A little more about Rommeldale as a breed. So they were started in the early 1900s in California. Uh, I don't think they ever really took off as a breed. And so the, one of the early breeders in the mid, I think in the mid 1900s started playing with the fact that there were colored wool sheep in this batch. So they started playing with it for, with the hand spinners in mind. Like how amazing is that? Uh, so there's a beautiful array of colors in Rommeldale. And it, I don't, I mean, it grew in popularity a little bit, but I don't think it ever took off. The breed is currently on the, I think it's considered a threatened breed by the American Livestock Conservancy. Let me make sure, yes, 
they are considered threatened. I think they have been downgraded as far as like how, how, how many there are. More people are breeding them now again. Um, absolutely beautiful. Uh, so when you, you often will see Rommeldale, Rommeldale CVM, CVM, what the heck does that mean you're asking? So the Rommeldale refers to the white, which was kind of the natural, or not natural, the original color of the majority of the breed, but then colors started popping out. So the CVM stands for California Variegated Mutant, absolutely stunning name. And so if you get a colored fleece, that's a CVM, technically the whites are Rommeldales. Uh, I mentioned that staple length tends to be around three inches. So a lot of times a bit longer than you're going to get in Merino. Uh, and it tends to be in the low twenties as far as microns. As I mentioned, it spins up into this very lovely lofty, lofty yarn, and it's so lightweight. It's just absolutely gorgeous. So give it a shot. I would like to say there's going to be some of this roving left. I don't know if you are wanting to get roving. My Fiber Club is currently full, but you can email me to get on the wait list to join the Fiber Club. It's a monthly subscription club. If you are looking for products from me, including something like this, my Patreon is the first place to go, $5 a month, and you get early bird notifications, plus more, plus so much more. But uh, my Patreon people kind of get first jump at fibers as they come off the carter. And then the newsletter is the next place, which you can just go on, cost you nothing to go on and subscribe to my newsletter on the website. Okay. I think I covered everything about Rommeldale that I was gonna cover, other than it's just amazing. Get your hands on it, spin it. Okay, let's go watch it being processed and then we'll come back and we'll talk a bit more about hand spinning stuff. Enjoy. Okay, you all, we are here beginning a fiber club and I want to show you this is the fleece I'm working on. So this is a Rommeldale fleece. There are a couple different colors. There's dark grays. There's this light gray. It's absolutely stunning. Stunning, stunning. Uh, this one was grown in uh, Oregon here on the other side of the mountain where it is a bit drier and in general an easier place to grow fine wools. So Rommeldale CVM, California Variegated Mutant is what that stands for and that takes into account the color of the wool. I believe it's a, a white Rommeldale. If there is color to it, it is a CVM because it was originally a white colored breed. So this is a very dense lock structure. Uh, and I will, I'm just picking out like the four pieces of hay that I have found in this fleece. I don't remember if this shepherd coats her sheep or not. I'm just gonna show you the gorgeousness that is that wool. It is just beautiful and it's very dense. So I'm doing, there's a lot of tiny crimp for those of you listening, but not uh, able to see. There is some beautiful tiny crimp in here. It's a high lanolin wool. It's not as high as some of the merinos I did more recently, but it's still pretty high. So I am of course trying to open up that dense lock structure as I'm putting it into the washer so that soap and hot water can do their magic easier. Uh, so just opening it up, I, I really don't treat it any different than I do any other wool, except that um, it may take a little extra washing. And I do, I'll take some time to, it just, I wouldn't say I'll take some time, it just naturally takes extra time to open up this wool versus say the Shetland that I did last month uh, because the, the lock structure ugh, is so dense, but it is an enjoyable, enjoyable fleece to skirt. And the other fleeces uh, for Fiber Club came from Washington State. And there is one more from Colorado, actually. And that one I bought 
online from a farm that I have been following for a long time. It's very hard to get their fleeces. And I managed to grab one. It has some rambouillet in it too, but not enough that it changed the fiber drastically, I would say. So I feel comfortable blending them. And uh, I need enough wool for my Fiber Club subscribers. So, um, and none of this wool came cheaply. Not that wool comes cheaply when you're trying to find it for hand spinning most of the time, but uh, some of these fine wools, the, they can get pretty pricey. And it does take extra work in a lot of ways. A lot of these are skirted, so, or um, I shouldn't say skirted, a lot of them are coated. So I'm gonna go ahead and finish this, and we will move onward to picking, which I'm hoping that these fleeces will do all right through my picker. We shall see. Okay, okay, we're here at the picker, and I wanted to show you what I've got left to pick from Fiber Club. So this is Rommeldale and these are the fleeces that are left for me to pick up and you can see there's a variegated grays There's natural whites. There's a really beautiful light fawn in here and They're getting all blended up to become this month's fiber club and In case you can't notice which you may this is the first time ever that I have recorded Without the audio remember how I mentioned I did that a couple weeks ago well, it happened here. So we are doing a little audio over so that we can <laughs> still have this video. All right, so I am gonna go ahead and pull out the fiber from the picker. We're sitting staring at the picker and I'm pulling out some of the extra fiber that gets caught up on the ends of the rollers. And I like to do that uh, occasionally because, as many of you know, when you are, when fiber hits one spot, it will then just keep building up in that spot. It's just like, it's like a magnet for other fiber. So I like to clean the rolls out and uh, before I start picking again. So here's this beautiful gray variegated, it was grays and some browns in there too. This fleece came from Central Oregon. So technically this would be a CVM, Rommeldale CVM fleece because it is a natural colored fleece. And this was probably the, I'm not gonna say that uh, it was actually the biggest fleece for sure. And I love that it had the color in it. It had a little bit more second cuts in it, which when you're working with finer wools is, um, you do have to pick a little bit more at, but uh, it is a beautiful fleece and, and lended itself really well to this blend. Here I have got on, this is the fleece that I was talking about that had a little extra rambouillet in it. But as we now know, rambouillet is the standard breed that started Rommeldale. So I just thought, eh, Never hurts to have a little extra rambouillet in there. So maybe I'd say there's an extra 10% rambouillet in this blend than there would normally be. And I'm gonna grab a different color here. Um, actually, that might have been backwards. Let's see. Now that I have it on there, yes, this is the rambouillet blend here, or the rambouillet, the fleece that had the extra rambouillet. The other one is I had two fleeces from them. I actually bought them at Oregon Flock and Fiber last year from a fiber farm up in Washington State, and they were both stunning. So um, look out when you go to these fiber festivals because there can be some absolutely gorgeous wool, even when it's later in the season. Sometimes um, the shepherds, you know, the shepherds are busy. They don't just get to all these festivals to sell fleeces. They have to make the extra effort. So, um, and I think there's one more bit. Nope. Okay. We're going in. We're going in. So we're close in to watch the fiber being picked up. And I was so excited. You can see that the rollers, there's nothing built up in there. If you watched the video a while back with the Shetland, it got really tied up in the rollers. And when I see something getting tied up in the rollers, that's when I get, it's when we hand pick basically. Uh, Cause it will break and just cause problems and cause static. And here we are looking at all the fluff. Uh, in the picker and it just picked out beautifully. I was over the moon by how this picked out and you kind of just want to dive into it. 
hope that didn't make you too sick <laughs> as I'm focusing in on all the fluff. So it's beautiful and I'm gonna condition it and then we're ready for the carter. All right, here we are at the carter. I'm kind of towards the end of processing all of this and sorry that what I'm saying is not going to match with my lips <laughs> in this video, but here we are at the cart. It's a little quieter. You don't get the carding machine going while you are listening to me. So with this fiber, it uh, carded up really beautifully. I did run it lighter. So uh, I ran this at about, I'm gonna say three ounces per feed or so, which generally my norm is around three, I probably, or three and a half ounces. I probably could have done a little more, but um, I didn't wanna push it with this fiber being a little more sensitive as it is. So you can see I am doing a little bit of opening up as most finer wools are. This is a really dense, um, the locks are very dense structure. And so if the picker didn't get everything open, I'm just always picking it out. And really a lot of what I'm doing here is trying to make sure that my feed is even, that the fiber is even on the feed, because what that means is that it's gonna come out as a more even roving which means it's gonna be better to spin. It's gonna be easier to spin. So um, that's my goal when I'm making these fibers is to make a fiber that spins up easily for all of you and for me. So let's go around and take a peek and see what's going on on the other side here. You get to see all of my mess in the middle as we swivel around and here it comes out as roving and it spins up so beautifully. It's this nice, because there was the fawn and there was the gray with some rounds in it, it's kind of this very light mocha-y fawn color and it changes throughout the fiber. So um, there it is, isn't that a beauty? Just as lovely to spin as it is to look at coming out of the carter. All right. I'm obsessed with this fiber. I mean, my fiber flip people know. I've just raved and raved and raved about it, but uh, I just can't say enough about this wool. So there you go. And there it was, and I am still over the moon at how it turned out and that I didn't have to hand pick it all. Yay, hurrah. So really quickly, because all wools are not created equal, but they all have a purpose and they're all beautiful. I just wanted to show some different wools side by side because we just talked about a new breed. So let's show this kind of standard Rommeldale lock. Let's show it next to some Suffolk. Remember that oldie but a goodie. This is that giant bale that I bought, gosh, probably two years ago or so. So you can see how different those are. Just night and day. And then for fun, let's throw in some Shetland because I've got it here. Shetland, I mean, Rommeldale. So they all have they all have different feels they all have different things you could use them for or you could use them for the same thing uh, but i just kind of wanted to remind that um, suffolk especially is a very you know it's not a breed you often see people doing hand spinning with but everybody that spun some of this fiber absolutely loved it so um there you go my heater's on my heater's on sorry you all okay um let me go turn that off real quick because we don't really need it and it cost me a fortune Okay, my light's getting a little crazy in here because it's getting darker. Uh, light's passing over. Anyway, we'll wrap it up here. So let's talk quickly about storage bobbins because you all had such great input and comments. I was just thrilled. Um, okay, so some of the comments that came in and we talked about storage bobbins last episode. So if you don't know what the heck I'm talking about, go back and watch last episode and then this will make a lot more sense and it may inspire you to try this, who knows? Um, Elon mentioned that she uh, bought a cast iron antique bobbin winder from eBay. So there's a place you can always look. I always forget about eBay, but it's still there, man. Um, and she bought that back when she first started spinning a long time ago. And that's how she, she does storage bobbins. Amazing, right? And she said she also could, you could also do from a center pool ball. You could also, yes, absolutely. You may have a little more fuss uh, with your center pool ball if you're not good at winding this, but that is another option for, that's like the zero cost storage-esque bobbin. Now all the nameless would probably say you need to have tension on it, but this is, this is, there's no wrong. 
um, June, this is the $3 option. June got a wood dowel, cut it into 10 inch increments, put it on the end of her drill, and then sanded down the dowel to fit the different sizes of bobbins she had. So she's like, that was $3. And so you just have your, your um, drill and you have a uh, bit, basically it would be a bit, right? Where your bit would be. Uh, you have a dowel and then you just wind your yarn. You have your storage bobbin or your regular bobbin over here of the room and you have your drill on the other side. This is what Sandy said too. She kind of has like a bed in between esque, like that kind of length in between. Um, and then you just wind it. It's a very calming type of thing. So uh, as we, as I kind of mentioned last time, this seems like, oh my gosh, it's another step, which it is. But like we're spinning yarn from hand. Like why does this have to be rushed? It doesn't have to be. So just an option. Uh, D mentioned uh, that she does, uh, m she does use storage bobbins a lot of time for evening out the twist. Same as what I did in the last video with my cotton yarn. By the way, I finished the second bobbin and I'm gonna actually put it onto a cone storage bobbin today before I leave and start plying. So um, I'm gonna let it sit for a couple days, but okay. She, so Dee mentioned that she got her, her winder from Fiber Artist Supply. And I looked on there and it's about $80. It's a manual one. And she uses sectional weaving bobbins, winds onto those. Those are her storage bobbins. Now she said she mainly does it if she wants to even out the twist, something's a little funky, something like that. So, you know, you don't always have to do it. Of course, you can do whatever you want, but you know, there's options. And for me, the cotton, it seemed like a no brainer once I figured it out because there are gonna be extra pigtails in this. Uh, just because I'm still newer at spinning cotton. So, um, and she reminded me, cause I, I think I'm gonna guess when I was doing the winding onto the cone, I said something about tension and getting those pigtails out. And she mentioned that it is the distance that evens out the yarn versus the tension, which is why we oftentimes put our bobbins far away from us to give that room uh, for things to kind of straighten out along the way. Occasionally you might need a little tension if your pigtails are really tight, <laughs> but um, in general. And then I think that was everybody's comments on the storage bobbin. So I am going to, I will certainly do a little video as I'm plying up that cotton probably next week so that you can see how it looks. But I think it's gonna be a much easier thing because when you get those pigtails on your bobbins, then your bobbin kind of does a quick little like skip when it gets to those spots, right? And there's where you lose some of that even tension in your applied yarn. So there you go about storage bobbins and some different options from zero to $80 or so. You can also get um, like Woolery or Revolution Fibers. I think they have uh, bobbins. They're meant for weavers, but it's the same idea except both ends are supported. So I think you can put a bigger bobbin on for winding, okay? Anybody else have comments on storage? Bobbins, let me know. Comment below. Supported spindle. I had a couple questions that I thought I would answer real quick and I was so excited, like uh, Carol commented and I was so pumped that she got inspired by me learning and decided to sign up for Josephine's class and is now practicing every day and really enjoying it. So made my day for reals. I get so excited. I know there are others of you that have reached out to me and said, I think I might pick up my supported spindle again, or maybe I'll go check out Josephine's class. I'll put a link to her class again in the show notes. And uh, Josephine Walton is the online course that I took for support spindle. She also does drop spindle courses and other fiber related stuff. So check her out, Pat, or I'm sorry, Carol. I'm so excited. Pat commented, first that she loves my haircut, so thank you. Doesn't look as good today, but you know, that's okay. Um, Pat asked, why do I have two cobs on my spindle? I will put a picture, because I forgot to bring a spindle. Bye. Okay, you all, um, I decided to film this little quick insert here to wear my faucet. So here it is. I couldn't put a picture because of the cluster I made. <sighs> by not getting the audio in that one, um, in those clips. So, okay, first my fancy way of storing my spindle. 
So I, so the first question was, somebody asked, and I'm so sorry, I forgot my notes to remember who asked, but um, they asked how I store my um, spindle when I still have fiber attached. And you can see, I don't do anything fancy. I have, you know, you could, one option I've done before is to just take it uh, and then kind of wrap it down and wrap it around here. And that'll keep it from making too much of a mess. I found it doesn't make that much of a mess though, but that's probably, if you're using a Tibetan, um, that's probably the easiest way I have found. I'll show you, I do have a new spindle here. And of course, did I get the name of who I got this from? No, but I will put it in the show notes and maybe I'll pop it in here below. So here is the first spindle that I have purchased. They, as I've mentioned, are not that easy to find, um, but I did manage to find this one. Um, and like I said, I'll put it in the show notes. So here is this little spindle. This one, I honestly, and you can see, I pulled it out and it's really not a big mess. I just kind of wrap it around a little bit and then stick it into my bag. So not super fancy. I haven't figured out how to carry them around. So I do need to find some sort of a carrying case. My friend Elisa was making bags that would be perfect for it. I don't think she's made one in a long time, but um, so there's that question. I think it was Pat that asked, why do I have two cobs going? Which you can see on both spindles I have got two cobs. So the cob is kind of the main spot where you have got your, your yarn building up. So I have got two going on both. One of them, the main reason is that Josephine, I took her class and she taught me this, but um, one of them is your temporary cob and one of them is your, your cob cob, I guess you call it your primary cob. Uh, so the main reason for doing this is that when you're spinning, you can just, on your temporary cob, you can spin, 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 just really quickly wind it on, keep spinning. Then what you do is wind off and make it into this more permanent cob. The reason being you can kind of organize the yarn a little bit better, take a bit more of a minute, and then also make it a little bit tighter so you can get more yarn onto your spindle by having this be organized. Like if you were just winding, 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 you may not get super organized, tight, all the things that will allow you to build up a fair amount of yarn before you have to start plying or do, taking it off the spindle, whatever you're gonna do. So um, so that's why on both of mine, I have got a main cob and then a temporary cob. When I fill up the temporary cob to whatever point I decide, then I unwind it and I can show you, I'm not the most masterful at this, but all I'm gonna do is kind of wind it around actually use my other hand, wind it around. And that's one of the things that with spindling I have found, like I, um, when I am spinning on my spindle, I draft with my left hand so I can maneuver the spindle with my right hand. That seems to be the easiest for me. I'm right-handed. Now when I'm at my wheel, I draft with my right hand. I don't know, whatever works. So all I have is I have it just kind of wound around my middle finger and then you're, pulling it off like so onto your hand basically so that you can rewind it onto your um, hopefully you can see this in the video I think I've got enough but I'm just gonna rewind it onto my hand and then I will rewind it onto the um, spindle onto that main cob and I'm trying to get this is the very last and this is that Rommeldale I took a little bit home. Uh, this is the Rommeldale. And so now I'm just gonna go ahead and I can kind of more mindfully get it onto here. I don't know if my video is still going now that I think about it, but, um, and however you do this is however you do it, but just more mindful. So I hope that answered both of those questions. Okay, you all, I was sitting here finishing up this winding, not making you all watch it all because I'm not the most graceful, but even this takes practice and you get better at it. And I was thinking this is essentially the equivalent of a storage bobbin. I think that's a safe way to look at this because I thought about the fact that you would, in theory, you would do a storage bobbin for this too, right? But if you do a temporary cob, remove the yarn and then re 
uh, wind the yarn on in a more meaningful, tight, and able to fix mistakes, kinks like that way, you're basically doing your own storage bobbin by going from a temporary cob to a standard cob. And I will show you one thing. I should talk about this spindle for a minute because one thing, and then you'll see, I'm just gonna kind of wind it around. That's how I store it. Okay, this, um, I'm not sure how close I can get. Let me stand up and I'll show you. So without, so you can see that this has a metal tip on it, which in Josephine's class she talks about, I think she actually has a free look for, um, you know, things to look for when you're looking for a supportive spindle. And the wood ones are wonderful, but she did mention that they will wear down in time if you use them a lot. So if you're planning on using one a lot, you may want to look for something that is a stone or a metal tip or glass as some of them are. So anyway, there you go. I'm done now talking about supported spindle until I keep talking about it. Sort of way. So um, I think that's all the questions I had about supported spindle. And for those of you picking it up, hurrah. It's so fun. It's, it's, a, it's a problem. Okay, really quickly, I want to show you a couple of new things I have in the shop. Uh, and then I'm going to skedaddle because I've kept you for long enough, right? So I did just get an order from Coco Knits. That's going to be in the shop, in the mill shop, but also I will get these up in the online shop as quickly as I can, hopefully when this goes out. One thing is something that I was looking at forever. It comes in this fancy little bag, which of course you can use as a project bag because we can never have too many. But what it is, is I don't know why, but I absolutely love this. So this just folds out. So it looks like, like kind of like a little laptop thing folds out and you can just like stick your patterns and stuff. It's got, it's magnetized. So you could put magnets, you could get a magnetic ruler and put it on there. So your pattern can be up in front of you. For those of us, we've had a big discussion about paper patterns versus using our phones or our tablets. This is like my dream come true. You can just put the pattern on here, then close it up, throw it in your project bag. I love it. So um, I will have these in the online shop. I have coveted these for a long time. So I'm excited they're here. And there is a little pocket so you can stick um, stuff in there too. So that's one fun new thing that is in the shop. Another thing is, I don't know why, but the, sometimes the most basic stitch markers. So these are Coco Knit stitch markers and they're just little metal, multicolored, simple. And I have some of these and I just really, I don't know why. Sometimes you just want just kind of simple, right? Uh, so there's that, it comes with um, six colors, five of each color, so that's a lot. And one other thing from Coco Knits is, I thought these were really cool too. So this is a sweater pop-up dryer type of thing. It's just like a mesh, can you see? It's the mesh, and basically it pops up and it lays kind of like a dome. So when you wash your sweaters or your hand wash stuff, you can lay it. Now you wouldn't, if you really need to do a lot of blocking, this is not gonna be the ideal thing. But most of the time when I'm hand washing sweaters or stuff, I don't really need to re-block them. I'm just trying to clean them. So this is, you can just lay your knitting on top. Air can move through the whole thing because it's a dome shape. Lovely. So um, I'll have those in the online shop. And one last thing, real quick. I don't think I've done an update on Utopia colors, but I have this new color in. And this is obviously, it's called Pink Roses. It's obviously over dyed on like a light gray yarn. And I love it. I would like somebody to make something with this and then show me. And actually, look at those two together. This is the, I don't even know if I've showed this. This is the garland. That green and that pink. They make me very happy. Anyway, Utopia Sustainable Wool. This is what I am knitting um, my current knitting project with that I talked about in the last episode. And it's lovely and squishy. Okay. I think that's everything, you all. So I think I'm going to get out of your hair. I am going to go card up some more fiber and actually do a video from back there. So you'll see me wearing the same thing. And um, my friend Elisa knit this and she didn't wear it. So she handed it down. Elisa, I love it. I will try to get the pattern from her and put it in the show notes. Okay, did we cover enough for this week? Next week, I am going to dive into my Fantasia 
spinning wheel that came in the mail. I cannot find my stain for the life of me because I it's unfinished, so I'm gonna stain it and show you all that. It's just not, it's not that daunting. Uh, so that'll be in next week's among other things. Okay, everybody, thank you so much for joining me and spending a little bit of time with me. I hope you got a lot of making done while you were watching or listening. Uh, until next week, stay healthy, be kind to everybody around you, and make so many pretty things until I see you. All right, thank you. Don't forget to hit that subscribe button.